It's time for a Drummer Nation. Best known for his work with Smash Mouth, Soundgarden, Chris Cornell, and Marilyn Manson, this rocker also has music degrees from the University of North Texas and the University of Miami. He has a signature line of brushes with Regal Tip, he's an astute art collector, and even designs hats. My interview with ultra-hip Jason Sutter, up next on Drummer Nation. Hello Jason, welcome to Drummer Nation and thanks for doing my show. Hey, Michael, how you doing today? I'm well, I'm well. Listen, I don't want to spend a lot of time on your early, early days, but where are you from and how'd you start playing? I'm actually from a small town in upstate New York called Potsdam, New York, which is kind of a cool, creative, hip little zone because there are three colleges there. So uh, it actually was kind of a cool little catalyst because there weren't uh, many drummers, even though there was a great a music school there called Crane School of Music and an amazing drum teacher who I studied with named Jim Peterzak who actually also taught Dave Weckl and Vinny Colliuto, which is bizarre. And um, it was a cool town because there were three colleges and there weren't a ton of drummers. And I, at a young age, I started actually getting to play in bars and uh, beer blasts at sororities and frat houses and stuff. So I was, I was able to kind of get employed and play with much older players. So it was kind of an amazing, unique experience. So uh, you went to school at North Texas State. Well, that's what it was called when I went there years ago. University of North Texas? Uh, it was actually, it was North Texas State my first year, and it switched to University of North Texas uh, the second year I was there. So I actually got to, to catch it while it was still uh, North Texas for those geeks out there who, who would care. But uh, it was amazing, man. I got to go there with an, a bunch of great, great, great drummers who I'm still very much in touch with and super proud of all that they've done from uh, Jim Riley from the Rascal Flats was my roommate and, uh, you know, uh, Rich Redmond was there, uh, Keith Carlock and I marched in the snare line together, um, which is bizarre. I just saw him in Nashville and just, you know, we stay in touch. A great drummer named Brian Delaney who's playing with Melissa Etheridge, Blair Sinta. Who's Jim White. Jim White, who's a fantastic jazz drummer and was, you know, one of the top guys. We came in as freshmen together and, uh, and actually graduated together, which says a lot because I came in with 72 drummers and my incoming class and 13 of us graduated that year. And Jim White was one of them. Uh, when we well, had I, I had the privilege of going to, uh, Ed Self brought me in to do something with the cymbal company. And I was able to address the drum students. And I pointed out that they should really take serious note of their peers. Because as great as the teachers in the school are, uh, that peer group is something else. Being there, I have to say, that was probably the biggest education is I would go and walk through this. It was not uncommon to have like six or seven guys camped out of someone's room and just hang. And you knew when they would shed and you knew when they would practice and dudes would come out. Carl Lockwood was right around the corner from me. We used to we used to wait, turn our lights off and wait till the janitor came through at midnight and locked everything up. And then around 1230, we'd turn our lights on and practice for like three more hours or two more hours or whatever. It was pretty cute. Um, uh, and uh you know, I would walk through those halls and I would have dudes, you know, freshmen, you know, young guys like Luke Adams, great drummer, guys like that, um, who came in as freshmen when I was graduating would knock on my door and just say, dude, what are you, what are you doing? What are you playing? If I was playing brushes or something, they'd say like, Hey man. And, uh, I did that numerous times with great drummers like Earl Harvin, Matt Chamberlain was there my first year. He was still kicking around. Um, uh, so really, really heavy drummers. And I learned more, I think, and watching Ed Sof. I'd go see Ed play, and, and it was just, it was more education than, than I would ever get in a lesson from him, just watching, getting to watch him play, and he played all the time. So I agree, it was, it was that was where the learning was happening, for sure. Well, and Ed Self is no slouch. He's a great teacher. Was he your primary drum set teacher? Actually, Ed was. He, he, you know, it's interesting. This, he's, he's about to, to retire, which is, fan, which is great for him. And, and uh, you know, Sad for everyone else, yeah. Yeah, sad, sad. But, you know, he's going to keep doing great things. I'm sure he's got a long... Um, long way to go but one of the coolest things i think i ever ever got to deal with or, or be a part of was uh drumhead magazine did an interview with ed so and they interviewed me on what it was like to study with ed so and they interviewed him on what it was like to, to teach certain drummers and i got to it was i got to hear his perspective on what it was like to teach me as a as a you know undergrad student and, and uh as well as you know peter erskine and 
and uh, Dave Weckl and, you know, a whole host of great, great, great players. But uh, that was something that was, it was kind of really amazing to hear his insight and what it was like. But to be there uh, studying with him, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the brush, brushes and his brush playing and, uh, and Jeff Hamilton, who is a mutual friend of ours, who's probably the best brush player alive. Um, and, um, it was amazing to get to study with Ed. And, and at, at one point I, I, I just said, Hey, I just want to study brushes. And he said, okay, here's the deal. If you come in and play your lesson down, um, in the first five minutes, and it's all good, we'll do brushes. And that's how we'll proceed. And so we did that for about two years until one day he, we, I came in, I played brushes. He sat there and he said, all right, we're done. You're good. <laughs> we're, fi we're finished. So. Coming from Ed, that's quite an accomplishment. It was cool. It was pretty amazing. Now, we'll, get, we'll get back to brushes in a second, but you also, so you got a degree from there in what? In uh, music education. And then you went to the University of Miami for a master's degree? I, I did. I and did. what's that in? Uh, that's actually an orchestral percussion. So I have like a legit degree there. I played timpani in the orchestra with ensemble and I played in the big band, you know, so I was still keeping the jazz going, but I was very heavily, you know, uh, I was teaching the drum line, playing in the big band, uh, playing in some, multiple small groups and playing in the orchestras. And my, I had to do a master's recital in orchestral percussion, like, you know, classical marimba. Multiple. Well, here's the disconnect that begs to be asked. You are quite an educated musician in all styles of percussion. And then you moved to Los Angeles and you became known as a rock drummer. Yeah, you know, I think I was always wanted to play drum set. I always wanted to play rock drumming, but I, I, I luckily studied with Jim Peterzak and, and great educators. I had great, great public school teachers who were really encouraging. And I think they, even though I was, like I said, when we started, I was working, I was a session drummer when I was like 13. You know, I really was. I was playing in three or four bands and some of the guys were as old as 30 years old mm -hmm. who were playing with me. So I was learning, you know, how to write contracts, how to deal with navigate personalities and bands, mm -hmm. um, how to book gigs, how to, you know, be prepared, be ready, stamina, play four hours a night. All those things I was learning while I was like literally, you know, I'd have to I'd come home at like three in the morning from a job and I'd have to wake up and be ready for school the next day. So I was, I really, it was a very unique experience what I had. I was playing in bars when I was 13, you know, that's no joke. I have record contracts I negotiated when I was probably 15, not record contracts, sorry, um, performance contracts mm -hmm. I still have from negotiating deals at playing at dances at, at other high schools, you know, that I negotiated. So when I come across things like that in my professional career, I've been there before and I think back mm -hmm. and it's like, wow, I did, I've been here like when I was a kid, even before college. That must but, have helped you quite a bit in Los Angeles. What was the first uh, name gig you got when you moved out there? Uh, when I moved to LA, I think the first gig I got was my friends in a band called American Hi-Fi. I had moved to Boston from graduate school. I got to get with a girl named Julianne Hatfield who was huge and was like a tour bus. So I was literally playing jazz in a big band. A friend of mine had seen me play at the Beer Blast when I was like 16, 17, and had a record deal in a band in Boston. This is eight years, seven years after. I had only been in college. I never played in a cover band or any pop music in college. Mm -hmm. Seven years, I just nose to the grindstone, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so he called me and said, you'd be perfect for this band. You play like this great drummer in town who works like crazy. And he's basing all this on seeing me play when I was 17. And I was like, all right. And he sent me the music. He set up the audition in Boston. I was in Miami shedding rock music for the first time in years. And I flew up there and I got the job with her. And that's where really the first big name. And, and literally uh, three weeks later, I was playing on Conan O'Brien which was a big deal because Conan was like just like mm -hmm. just happening. And so it was kind of cute. I literally all my friends threw a party f in my name, in my honor at, at Miami and had a big black party and watched the show on, on, uh, on, on TV. So it was kind of cute. But literally I went from like, you know, jump, just jump right into it. So um, you, were, and then, you got there ready, loaded for bear, industry wise, playing wise, got that gig. What was the next one? Uh, from there, I actually got a record deal with a band. I joined a band called Jack Drag. I did John Dragonetti, who's a massive composer, is on um, We Are Legion and all these great, great soundtracks. He, he does all the music for these great movies and TV shows. And now, but John, I met John, real creative, uh, was a drummer as well. I got a deal, got, got playing with him, and within months, we got a publishing deal with Sony, and then within months, we got a, a bidding warrant, signed a uh, record deal with A&M Records, 
with so it was just it was incredible to be in that college environment when, when it was just a hotbed. It was post Nirvana mm -hmm. gold rush. Everyone wanted to sign everybody. We were playing in Boston, which was just it was so healthy and wonderful. And so I stayed there for about four or five years. And then I and played with that band and got in, and played with another band called Letters to Cleo, which was one of these dear friends of mine uh, was playing drums before that named Stacy Jones. And before Stacy Jones was Abe Laboreal Jr. So it was a cool lineage of great players. Played with them, toured you know toured all of US with that band with Everclear, and and then I moved to LA because I'd made a record with that band Jack Drag, and I thought this is where I should really be. And right before that, I got a call from a kid named Ben Lee. Played with Ben Lee, toured Australia, toured all over the US, and then moved to LA and and got a gig with with. Uh, my buddy Stacy and that whole band called uh, American Hi-Fi, which was great, toured all over the U.S., toured Europe, toured Japan. And then from there, I got called to play, in, uh, to do a musical, a preview for a musical call that would be ultimately become a Rock of Ages, and um, which is massive and one of the longest running shows on Broadway in history and won you know, Tonys and all kinds of awards. And I literally sat in a room with a guitarist, the same guitarist who actually recommended me for the gig that I got in Boston. We played in high school and ironically, we actually played in Greece <laughs> together in high school. He played guitar and I played drums. And here we are years later forming, basically arranging the music, which would for this musical that would become Rock of Ages. Well, that network so thing really works. You know, it's amazing. If you look back over the years, I think for everybody, there are people you sort of stick with your whole life, you know, that that uh, come into your life for who knows why and you end up as brothers and, and play for decades together. Absolutely. I, I, I say that when I, I try to do as many lectures or clinics as I can at colleges because I feel like I've learned a lot of stuff that I would, I would, I'd like to, to, to lay on these cats in this college because I didn't really have anybody, you know, in college you're kind of in a bubble mm -hmm. and rarely, rarely really get the real sauce of what it's like to be out in the real world. So I love to try to bridge that gap having sat in their seats. And I always say, like, look around you because these are the people that you're going to, you know, ultimately are you're going to be with whether you like it or not. Whether you like them now or not, there's a good chance you're going to run into them again because most of them are going to be um, your your they're your, they're network, your peer group. You know? Yeah. So Absolutely. from that, you uh, some of the larger names we know of came after that, like right. Well, I did I did Rock of Ages, and from while I was doing that, I got a call to do a, uh, a tour with a band called the Rembrandts. And so I subbed out this Rock of Ages thing. It was just uh, in LA. It was happening in LA. I subbed that out and did three months with the Rembrandts post Friends. It was like a big kind of like a, I don't know, a greatest hits tour. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing. And then I got a call to uh, uh, audition. And ultimately I got the gig with the band, the band Smash Mouth and did a record with them and did a tour for them with them for a year. And I got a call to audition for Chris Cornell and I did it and um, ended up doing that for three years. And then from there, I got while I was while I was touring with Chris, I was recording with Vertical Horizon, um, who I've known for years, and actually turned them down because I had that band on A and M. Uh, even though I knew they were going to be huge, Matt and I met because he saw me play on Conan O'Brien. So you can see the circle is amazing. He saw me play on Conan O'Brien. We met at a bar, and he remembered me on Conan O'Brien and was like, "You you need to be my drummer." This is a true story. Perfect. And uh, years later, he came to see Rock of Ages with his wife, who's an actress, and was like, "I found you. I've moved to L.A." You're playing on my next record. Mm -hmm. True story. This is all tying it in. And so I ended up playing on his record throughout that Cornell on and off when I was home. And so when Cornell ended, I toured with Vertical Horizon on a record called Burning the Days, which also included Neil Peart, which was amazing. And I got to meet Neil and talk about playing drums together mm -hmm. and what it was like to play on that record, which was super cool and a great way to meet him. You know. Well, I want to ask and, you about uh, Chris Cornell was a drummer originally, right? Yeah, he was the original drummer and sound. And so did he have specifics for you in terms of advice, or did he just uh, let you play what you, what you heard? None at all. None at all. It was amazing. He held a really extensive audition. It was three weeks of audition. Mm -hmm. He went through like 25 drummers. I don't even know how many guitarists. And I'll never forget, I've never had anyone like that. And most gigs, you know, most dudes are insane. You know, I can almost say that now at this point. Most artists, you know, I don't say this in clinics, but the fact is, and I have students who come back to me, they get a gig and people don't ever talk about this. And I don't talk about it in clinics, but I'm going to talk about it here. But most artists are insane. They're a nightmare. It's so much, you can't navigate personalities. You can't navigate that. And that just comes with the territory. It's just how it is. And Cornell was the sweetest, kindest um, funniest, most educated, beautiful cat. He still is. We talk all the time. I, I, I stay in touch with him and I, I, I just, we had such a great time 
He's very shy, very, very keeps to himself. But once you're behind closed doors, he's the, he opens up. And I have to say, one of the coolest things he ever did, I've never had anyone do this, after this extensive audition, great young players who were just ready to you know, breathe fire to the world, like, you know, we're here. He pulled us aside and he said, you know, I've auditioned you guys, and I just want you to know that you can do no wrong. And anything you, you hear or feel, I trust you, and I urge you to follow your, your, uh, follow your voice. It's what every drummer to wants to hear, man. It was incredible. Yeah. Now, was I, I imagine incredible. working with, uh, was quite a different personality working with Marilyn Manson. Yeah, Manson. Manson was the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was all. Um, it was no. It was never encouragement. There was never any positivity. It was all negative. But you know what? That's what m the majority of gigs are like. I love Manson. He's awesome. I you know if I saw him right now, we'd have a have a laugh and and great. It was great. But his personality was not of that type. And most artists are are of that mm -hmm. type. They're, you know, they're going to be very, you know possessive and uh you know try to you know micromanage everything it's just how it is it's just a natural fact of when you're dealing with people who've reached that level the majority of them in my experience and most of my friends experiences you're going to have to navigate that personality you're going to have to feel confident enough with your playing yourself to be able to just take that and just move forward because it's not personal in most exactly. cases it's just it's not it's personal them. i've worked with a lot of world class artists through my symbol companies and and many of them are what you might call pieces of work. But if, as long as they know you respect them and you understand and appreciate where they're coming from, they're human beings that are pretty easy to deal with. Yeah, you just have, I mean, it's part of the job. Mm -hmm. It's part of the job. I don't talk about it in clinics because I'd like to try to keep that mm -hmm. upbeat. You know, but the fact of the matter, because you know, why talk about it? Because you don't know. Maybe, maybe half these kids will get a gig where it won't be that. But the amount of gigs where you're in a situation where you're comfortable, people are respectful, everything is cozy and good, and everyone's cool is is very few. Sadly, it's just it's the nature of the beast. And I'm not being negative. I, I'm at the point in my career where I've done it enough where I can say that's generally how it well, is. Well, it's a good and positive so, well, point you're making, which is that we all need to thrive and survive in creative environments, which are oftentimes volatile. Yeah, and you need to be confident enough with yourself and your playing mm -hmm. to be able to persevere and not take it personally and, and play well regardless. And that's that's half, you know that's half the battle. A lot of people would crumble under that or give up or leave, and you have to really persevere. You have to stick it yeah. out. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Peter bit. Erskine cites that as a theme of his book, No Beethoven, that you know, in, in spite of the troubles and travails with this artist or that, uh, he learned that none of it's personal. Everybody's just trying to right. make the best music they can and, and not uh, particularly uh, walking on eggshells to do so. But at the end of the day, it's not personal. Yeah, luckily when you're on stage, unless maybe with Manson where he would be screaming at people, but <laughs> generally when you're on stage and you're playing the music, everyone shuts mm -hmm. up and that's a beautiful thing. And then you're actually just playing music and, and that's what it's all about. Right. You know, I mean? if it's a band you believe in, you feel like you're actually offering something or being able to be creative and, and play well in that environment, as long as it's not compromising you as a player or your soul, then it's worth it to live for the, to deal with it for those, you know, for that 30 minutes to an hour and a half that you're on stage. And, and that's, that's, that's a fact, you know? Well, you must be doing a great job of handling all those peripheral things that happen on the bandstand and in a band besides playing the drums because you're so in demand. But let me ask you about when you were a student at North Texas and the university of Miami, were you thinking in the back of your head you were a rocker? Yes, I was always mm -hmm. going to do this. I was, I was. There was no question. This is what I was going to do. But I, I know we 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 kind of, kind of went off a little bit when you asked this question earlier. Um, when I was in college, my I was around such great mm -hmm. educators that they urged me to look around the corner and really go to a great school, spend the time, even though. Uh, it, you know, and I would urge that to anyone go to a great music school, you know, and I talk about this in clinics, get out of your comfort zone, push yourself to be better because it will, you know, as a percussionist, because there's so many facets of, of drums and drumming and, and percussion that I think it all lends itself to a better touch on a ride cymbal or a better, you know, uh, ghost note on a snare drum or something. I think playing timpani and understanding marching percussion and all those things for me, um, I luckily had a great education. You know, my parents were professors. You know, I learned that you really, even though this isn't exactly 
I, 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 I basically say it's like eat your vegetables and you can have dessert, <laughs> you know? And I went and I ate my vegetables for at North Texas and at Miami. And, and North Texas was, was, was the movie Whiplash. Mm. My experience there was that. It's not even funny. I had a pretty, ne- I went true. there as a kid and I had a pretty negative yeah. experience as well. Um, yeah, it wasn't well, negative. I wouldn't say negative, I would say positive. difficult. It was awful. It was awful and it was not right. fun. I didn't have fun in college. What I did have in college was was a great exactly. education. And I got I was prepared for the world which is a, is a, it's a mm-hmm. tough place if you're mm-hmm. playing music and I'm not trying to be dark because it's all positive. I'm living in a house I bought by playing drums. It's mm-hmm. awesome. You know, I have a great life. I got to do everything I ever wanted to do and I I, I can thank Robert Chitroma. I can thank it was the head of North Texas. Mm-hmm. I can thank Ed Sove. I can thank Ron mm-hmm. Fink and all these great players who uh, professors and educators and Steve Rucker at Miami for kicking my ass and basically not settling for any less and making mm-hmm. me not settle for less and look and, 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 and using examples rather than just saying it, I was constantly reminded. I learned so many, every, every day was a lesson right. and it wasn't pretty, but it, it prepared me for. Well, it's, work. it's not a bad and thing I, to have your ass handed to you on a couple of occasions. It, it, it's a test of yeah. character. And if you handle it the right way, it could be the best thing that ever happened to you. Now I got to talk well, about your brushes because uh, uh, what what a surprise from the drummer with Marilyn Manson to have a, uh, a regal tip uh, signature brush out, but but uh, yeah, yeah, I remember out. after the Chicago yeah. drum show, you and me and Daniel Glass and uh, Kurt Biscara, Stanton Moore, a bunch of us went out for pizza and you were showing off your brushes and we got a pizza box. Remember that? And yeah, everybody's yeah. passing around the pizza box and the brushes, and what a cool hang! And it went deep into the night in the hotel lobby. That uh, you know, like five, six drummers the swapping best. ideas on brushes. And that's that's one of the beauties of percussion and really going that distance to guys. Those are guys. What you're mentioning, all those cats went and looked mm-hmm. around the corner. They cared, even though they're drum set players. They cared about all mm-hmm. these other aspects of percussion, and it really made them a better player. And so to be able to sit down with that magnitude. But you just said all those names, those cats are the new breed of guys who care enough to really try to carry on the tradition of Philly Joe Jones. And and when I met Stanton Moore 10 or 12 years ago, he'd be the first to tell you he was not much of a brush player, but he looked around the corner, man. He he, he checked it out. He put himself to school and he's constantly getting his ass kicked. I can't I can't meet Stanton Moore anywhere at at an event where he doesn't say. He's like, you know, you know, we're going to we're going to my my mm-hmm. hotel room mm-hmm. after this. You yeah. know, we're going to hang. I, we got it. You know, it's like he's constantly seeking out education. And the next time and, you uh, see him, he's got it. it. And then something else to show you back. Oh, you know, he's just a beautiful <laughs> player. And he's a, he's like a machine. And not and, and not to mention, I am learning so much mm-hmm. being around him and inspired so much being around people. And, and he's he and Daniel and everyone you mentioned. That's the beauty of being mm-hmm. a percussionist and being involved in these in this in this wonderful kind of community is to be able to share that and learn and uh, and you know talk about getting my ass kicked. You know, I I you know got to study with with uh, our mutual friend Jeff Hamilton, and that's what that was like. It was like going back to study with Ed Sof. It was like just you know it was tough love, man. Uh, you know, tough love, I, and it took it took me two years to get. I remember the first. I studied with you know, Jeff a long time ago for a long time. And the first lesson I went to him, I thought I had some brush stuff together, and I remember going home thinking, "Boy, back to the drawing board." <laughs> yeah well i knew i knew going into it i was going to be in a world of mm-hmm. hurt you know and all i really wanted to get from jeff was just an inkling a tiny little speck of the right. grace that he has in this playing that's all i wanted i just wanted a little i knew i would never get that i would never be able to approach get close to what absolutely he has happening you know everybody it, always asks me yeah. about hamilton when i know i studied with him show me some brush stuff and i'll always say well i'll show you what i know but on a good day <laughs> I have delusions of adequacy. All yeah. you have to do is watch Hammer play, and it it, it spells it all out. He, he's the greatest. Yeah. It's like it's like moving mm-hmm. mountains and waves, tidal waves, and it's like earth shit. You know, it's like and uh, but he's a beautiful cat, and and he's you know I literally followed him into a bathroom at Nam once, <laughs> and at, like asking him, I, I had to beg him for two years before he finally said, yeah, okay, fine, I'll give you a lesson, you know, and then we. You know, I got to you know, I I got to study with him for for a couple of years on and off, and uh, it was incredible. And, and honestly, I I mean, we're I, I hope to still you know get get with him when I can. But at this point, we've played enough where I feel like I can you know, it's like I have hours and months and weeks and years of time I need to spend to try to just yeah. again. 
Well, he doesn't want to give it away to people who just want to cop his shit. You know what I mean? You got to be dedicated to that and show that that's what you're all about. But, and then he's just the most gracious cat in the world. But, but, um, what I wanted to touch on something a little different with you because you're quite an astute art collector. How did you, and, and I I think you're involved with iconic rock and roll photography. Tell me how you got involved in that. Well, my father's a sculptor, but you know, this is my house, you know, this is, my house this is one of my places i have a couple places in you know across the u.s and and uh you know this is a, a norman Steve joni mitchell from a Jera. it's number 23 of 50. this is uh an andy warhol electric chair from 1972 this is a warhol cow mm-hmm. you know i mean i could go on and on you know it's like just in my living room um you know, there's a frank stella over here around the corner and that's a warhol on the wall of mildred shield and you know, I, I'm a collector, you know, I, I, you know, I always, I grew up in galleries thanks to my father. And, um, and I learned early on, like, you know, it's a beautiful thing. And if you can surround yourself with art, it's just one of those things that will inspire you at, at, for the rest I of your agree. life. Yeah, I you always know? like to so, talk to you about it. Cause those are some of my favorite artists as well. So, uh, do you paint at all? I do paint, you know, it's funny. I was going through some stuff the other day and I found a bunch of watercolors and I did do a bunch of watercolors and I was like heavily into art in high school, but you know, again, because I had such a great, uh, you know, kind of a support group, I realized early on I had to do one or the other. I, I still paint a little bit, but I, I don't really get into it that much. I should, I should, I should just pull it out. But I was, was really into it in high school and I realized, you know, I gotta, I gotta go. If I'm going to do music, I gotta go big, but I always wanted to have a collection of art. And as soon as I started making money, it's a, it's a very smart investment, but unfortunately most people don't, it's easier to put money in a right. 401k or a, you know, a mutual fund. Well, and, you have to um, understand the, the but you're it, buying as well. Uh, you do. And anybody out there, call me up. I'd love to help you out as far as like what's worth buying because it's, it is really an art, it is an art form in itself, no pun intended, but I think it's really important. More people should be buying art and, and it is a really wonderful investment. Art doesn't lose its value ever. And people don't, aren't aware of that and, and they don't know where to look and they don't know how to start. And there's books you can buy, and sure. you, can, you know, just get up and go to an art museum and start looking around and see what you like and do a little investigating on the online. And you'd be amazed that we could find at auctions. And I, I'm really proud to be able to help a few friends of mine kind of build. Well, I may be calling on you to do and, that at uh, some point. Uh, I would love, I would love that. And art and rock photography just happened through, you know, I got to be photographed in these certain mm-hmm. situations and meet the living in Los Angeles. Some of the yeah, greatest living photographers at the time, a lot mm-hmm. of them have passed since and became really close friends. And I bought a bunch of their work and I was shot by them. And, and it's, it's the same thing. You know, I have, you know, rooms that are filled with rock photography. It's inspiring and, uh, and it's a great investment and, uh, it's, it's one of those things. It's, yeah. it's time. Uh, one more unusual, it. one more yeah. unusual question. Nice hat. Tell me about your your hat. It's your hat and your. Uh, you know, this hat actually is 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 one of many. I uh, at an art gallery. I ended up in in Dallas, Texas, at the uh, um, Goss Michael Foundation, which is actually owned by George Michael, which is somebody would uh, probably wouldn't know, but uh, pretty incredible if you're ever in Dallas. Go to the Goss Michael Foundation, and it's a wonderful gallery. They have a permanent collection there of all Damien Hirst, and it's one of a kind Damien Hirst that are all from George Michael's collection. Um, and uh, I've I've bought and sold art with them, which is kind mm-hmm. of kind of awesome because I try to collect and buy and sell for for as well when I can, and uh, that's part of being a collector. And so check that out. While I was there, I ran, ran into a friend who, uh, a, a, was now a good friend of mine who was work is working at Stet was working at Stetson. He was a head designer of, of hats for Stetson to get away from the typical cowboys and, you know, trying to get them into the hands of new Americana country right. hip players. And so he hit it off and I ended up designing a whole line of hats with him based on native American. Uh, That's what I thought. Chiefs. You designed a line of hats based on native American Indian chiefs. I did. Yeah, I did. It was pretty amazing. And so we got to like basically go with these photographs of these great chiefs like Sitting Bull or Mm -hmm. Rain in the Face or, you know, different uh, chiefs that, um, uh, you know, had, uh, you know, photographs where you see these really kind of iconic looking hats that they wore and they wore them differently than your average cowboy Mm -hmm. or or, uh, you know, um, you know, dignitary or, or whatever, you know, they, they would take buy a hat and instead of having a shape, they would just ride away with it and let it kind of get shaped by nature. And, uh, and that was, that was kind of the, 
so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just interested. Well, you're a very interesting stuff, character, man, you know? man, from the background in jazz and classical music to your extended career as a rock and roll player, your signature brush, your awareness of all styles, art collector, hat designer. Uh, it's, it's been great chatting with you, and I always look forward to hanging with you every time we get together. Um, what's coming up next? Wonderful. I'm actually heading to Europe to do a drum clinic tour. Um, which is a first for me. I, I just did a series of clinics in Japan, which was amazing. I was playing with a great artist there named Tak Matsumoto, mm -hmm. uh, living in Japan and recording his, his record. There's a DVD that just came out uh, live at Budokan, which is just mind-blowingly cool. It's all instrumental. It's like he's the Jeff Beck mm -hmm. of Japan, but so much more and so interesting. And what a beautiful cat. Check it out. But uh, while I was there, I did some clinics and uh, – I kind of I, I got asked to do the Poland Drum Festival in October, late October, and then I got asked to do the London Drum Show in November. And then we just Ludwig, you know, and I kind of talked, and we said, "Hey, what about filling that up?" And I think we're doing 11, uh, 11 clinics in the course of like well, two I've and a half weeks clinics, in Europe. And they're wonderful. Started. You cover rudimental stuff, rock and roll stuff, jazz stuff, brush stuff, and industry stuff. Let's give a little love to your your sponsors. I know you're with Regal Tip. Uh, Regal tip drumsticks. I have a signature stick and brush that are the coolest in the world. I get notes every day from somebody, it doesn't matter who or what company they're with, and they'll sh you know just send me a picture of them playing mm -hmm. the brushes on a session or at a award ceremony or in their practice room, and 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 it's super cool. It's it's been very well received. Regal tip are fantastic. They make some of the best great people, great people and, too, and brushes. Who else you with? Great people, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Peisty symbols, you know, I have a very mm -hmm. close relationship with them and they make beautiful from jazz symbols. I have to say I, I, their jazz symbols, their mm -hmm. master series are incredible to all the rock symbols I use. Um, and, uh, uh, I, I'm a remote drum heads, which is, you know, I, I can't Iconic, say enough about yeah. remote. It's remote. What do you say? That's just, and, uh, and then I'm, uh, DW Hardware. I've been with DW Hardware for 21 years, which is unbelievable. I, I started with DW in 95 when I first got that Juliana gig, and I've, I've stuck with them with their hardware and pedals. And so Good that's there. No reason to leave. And my, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's all there. Uh, love that, love that company. Love those people. And uh, I was on the phone with them yesterday talking about these clinics and they're just so just, I, it's another level really. So where do people find out about the clinics on your, what's your website? Um, the website is uh, jasonsutter.com, and uh, on there I'm, I'm about to post a PDF of everything. But basically, it starts in Europe on the 30th of uh, uh, 20th of October and ends on the 13th of November. And and everything's on my website, bios, clinics. If you're interested in checking it out, there's clips of mm -hmm. some of the clinic ideas and there's uh, photographs. And uh, I try to keep that. All right. Current. Well, thanks so, for sitting down with uh, me and, and and doing my show. I hope to see you uh, maybe in. In Nam, at Nam in LA in January. You think you might be there? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I can't wait. And and Michael, wonderful uh, to get to do your show and get right. to hang out and chat, man. Thanks, brother. Always I'll talk to you soon. Bye. bye bye. Awesome. This is your host, Michael Vosbein, and I want to thank our friends at Atlanta Pro Percussion, Danette Classic Drums, Sabian Cymbals, and Classic Drummer Magazine. We'll see you again in two weeks.